Good morning, everybody. Yes. You had a good day yesterday? Yes. And a good evening? I thought the, the whole day was uh, fantastic. And uh, we have a short day today, uh, but it will be as fantastic, I think. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I know somebody have seen the news this morning, and they saw some photos of uh, the airport, and some, but someone started to ask me, what's happening on the airport, will there be delays today or, or what? But um, we have the airport manager for Oslo Airport here, and uh, <coughs> Nick, uh, uh, people can relax, yes? Yes, certainly they can relax. Airport operations are normal. We did have some freezing rain this morning, which have now turned into snow, which we are used to handle at this airport. So relax, it's normal. Uh, but we have And you know, at, uh, at Oslo Airport, they always guarantee a very short time through security, so you can just <laughs> take it easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, we will not continue with talk at this early stage. We will have some music. Some of you may uh, recognize uh, Tron here from uh, the band uh, yesterday. Uh, those who cannot remember him from yesterday. I can assure you that most Norwegian, they recognize him from the very popular TV program Beat for Beat every Friday evening. <coughs> so he's uh, in charge of that band. I don't know how many band he has, but uh, here he ha <coughs> has Freydis with him, who's also appearing every Friday on TV with her saxophone, uh, where they are playing in the same band. Uh, Freudists also have a lot of other bands. They will play two tunes for us now, please. I, I, I forgot one thing I have to say about Tron. When he was a kid, <coughs> I, I, I found out, without him telling me, I found out that he worked so hard, hard on his piano when he was a kid that his brother and sister, they called him Wolfgang Nuisance. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Tusen tack. So uh, good morning everyone. It's a pleasure to be invited here to play a couple of songs for you. And uh, we started out with Jan Garbarek's Molde Cantacle. And then we played a Swedish waltz called Valsen till dig, the waltz to you. And now we're going to take a little trip into Norwegian nature. We're going to play the Beatles classic Norwegian Wood.
Thank you, Trond and Fredis. That's what I call a good start <laughs> on a Thursday morning. We just need one minute uh, here on the stage before the first speaker, so please uh, stay uh, in the room. Just one minute. Good morning. Nice to see all of you again. I hope you enjoyed yesterday as much as I did. The Ministry of Transport and Communication is responsible for all policies relating to transport of goods and people, telecommunication and postal services. And I'm sorry to say that the Minister herself has caught a flu and has hardly no voice. And that must be critical critical for a politician. But uh, luckily for us, her Secretary of State, Guy Polestar, will step in for her. And he is ready to answer some questions after his speech, so prepare yourself. So it's an honor for me to introduce Guy Polestar. Good morning, aviation friends. <clears throat> I would start to say that the minister is cancelled due to technical problems. Thank you for inviting the minister. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, in the discussion or the debate about uh, transport and communication in Norway, we often talk about roads, railways, but today, we are going to talk about the importance of Norwegian aviation. And uh, Avinor is in many ways the heart of Norwegian aviation. Avinor is responsible for operating the majority of our airports and for providing air navigation services. By doing so, Avinor manages an important job in the Norwegian society. The ownership of Avinor is therefore an important political tool for the Ministry of Transport and Communication in order to ensure a well-functioning air transport network in Norway. Air transport is of major importance to Norway. We have a widespread population and long distances. These reasons make air transport even more important to Norway than to most other European countries. And we fly more domestic air miles than other Europeans. We have more airports per capita than any other European country. In uh, many parts of Norway, the aviation has the character of local public transport system. And air services between our largest cities are very good. I live Outside Stavanger, I work in Oslo. I have three small kids. I travel from uh, Stavanger to Oslo several times a week. I'm very glad if I miss the flight at 8 o'clock in the morning, I can go by the flight 10 minutes past 8. And uh, I know that Norwegian is very glad when I miss the 8 flight because that's a SAS flight, and Norwegian has the flight 10 minutes past 8. 
There are the, the many regional airports and the route network play a key role in assuring competitive industrial and commercial activity in the regions. The many regional airports and route network also offer the opportunity for long distance community. One of the important prerequisites for Avenor's operation is cross subsidization. This means that the commercial profitable airports contribute to the operation of the commercially unprofitable. This is an example of how Avenor operates as an important tool in ensuring a regional airport network. That makes it important for me to ensure that development of airports outside the Avenor system does not adversely affect the decentralized airport nationwide. The government's av aviation policy of regional airports and cross-subsidization is all described in our governmental policy plan, the so-called Surya Moria II. It's important to ensure that the majority of domestic routes can continue to operate without government subsidies. Direct routes to foreign destination also from others, uh, other airports than Oslo Gardermoen is another important goal. We will continue to subsidize commercially unprofitable routes through the public service obligation scheme, the PSOs. The goal is to ensure scheduled flights to all corners of the nation. I think it's still a need for governmental intervention in our national aviation market, also in the future. The theme for this conference is turbulent times in the aviation industry. I will therefore start by talking about the globalization of this industry and the challenges we see ahead. The aviation industry has become more international. We have seen a significant change the last 20 years, and we have a more harmonized set of EU regulations. This means both challenges and opportunities for the aviation industry. And I think it's a lot more efficient to have 27 countries operate under the same set of rules and certifications. At the same time, Norway is a country with special needs it is important to have international regulation adjusted to Norwegian special needs. And this is an area we work, uh, we work on every day. Globalization of the aviation industry will, in other terms, mean more competition. For, and uh, and uh, the liberalization of the avi aviation industry uh, will challenge established Norwegian systems. Let me take some examples. Norwegian airlines have now established hubs in Europe. It's Norwegian with in Malaga and Las Palmas and have hired Spanish personnel. Another example, a Norwegian airline with the same with the name, which sounds very Norwegian, uh, has established long distance companies with hubs in Asia, flying ro routes to different destinations in Europe. There are claims within the industry that airlines who hire pilots from external companies have pilots that do not pay tax as they should. And what about international airlines flying in Norway? Should we claim that they operate with the same salary and work condition as Norwegian workers? I think we should start with, answer that question with yes, and then we have to face to the reality, and then we have to make a conclusion, because these are all difficult questions. And it is understandable that Norwegian workers within the aviation industry do want regulations that protect their own jobs and routes. On the other hand, uh, we want flex 
flexible regulation to secure the economic route for the company. Customers often want tickets at the lowest possible cost. The government do want a combination. On one side, we want to give Norwegian Airlines the opportunity to adjust to the international market and competition. We want to give Norwegian companies the opportunity to grow and ensure Norwegian jobs. On the other hand, we want to secure the workers' right in the best way possible uh, for Norwegian and international airline personnel. We need to work together to find out how we can secure this in the best possible way. The single European sky is an important tool in order to ensure efficiency on the management of the air navigation services in Europe. Single European Sky is a very dynamic initiative which develops over time. The primary goal is to meet future capacity, environmental and safety needs through legislations and especially by use of the new performance scheme. The Norwegian Civil Aviation Authority is involved in this process, keeping close contact with the various stakeholders throughout the process. To me, it's of great importance that Avinor plays a major role in Norwegian air traffic management also in the future. Airspace blocks shall contribute to a better use of airspace. Together with Finland, Estonia and Latvia, Norway has joined such a block. It's called NEFAB, not European Functional Airspace Block. The agreement between the four states have now been approved in all the participating states, and the NEFAB cooperation will start operating in December this year. This means that we have a new legal framework for the cooperation in this field between the ministries of these four states, the civil aviation authorities and not least between Avinor and the service providers in the other participating states. Our two neighboring countries, Sweden and Denmark, are not part of NEFAB. Despite this, we will make sure that we have a close and good relationship with them on this matter. Our ambition is to establish a more formal framework between all the Nordic countries in the near future. An initiative is under preparation by the NEFAB states to engage Denmark and Sweden in discussions about this. The goal is to, is to ensure a more efficient management of air traffic in the whole area of Northern Europe and to ensure that this goal is ac <coughs> accomplished in a harmonized manner. The so-called CESA program is a very <coughs> important initiative <coughs> as the technological pillar of the Single Sky Initiative. It has the potential for delivering great benefits for air traffic management. But CESA comes with a price a high price in terms of investments, and the new concepts and technological solutions may turn out to be less well adapted to circumstances in Norway and other countries in Northern Europe than in the central part of Europe. Our aim is to ensure that Norway makes the best possible use of the results from the CESA program, while taking into account the particular circumstances for aviation in our country. Avinor has been in the media a lot lately in connection to air traffic management uh, challenges. Uh, I think also today uh, you can read about it in the uh, newspaper and uh, this past summer uh, in, the, in the busy weeks there was a lot of focus on this. For me it's important to say that Avinor have uh, they are responsible for this situation and need to fix it. I know they have a plan of education more air 
control staff. And the situ situation shall not repeat itself next summer. Avinor has also pr presented uh, a plan uh, for, the, for the company. Uh, they lift many important topics, like organization uh, of the air navigation services in a daughter company of Avinor, and the opportunity to pay fewer dividends to the state in order to fulfill plans of building and extending airports. The government will need to get back to these questions when we present the Avinor report to the parliament next year. We are open to dis discuss outsourcing, not as a goal in itself, but if and only if it leads to better solutions. And uh, we are also in, a, in the process of developing a new national transport, transportation plan for Norway for the next 10 years. Uh, the structure of regional airports will be a topic. There are a lot of things going on, and I'm looking forward to cooperate with you all on these topics. But I, uh, and there are other topics I could say something about, the one-stop security. Uh, we are working a lot with uh, that. I need your help to tell some other politicians how important it is. Uh, and we have the economic situation in, the, in the some of the, 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 the companies. We could discuss that. My comment is no comment. Uh, so I would just say thank you uh, all for your kind attention. I wish you all a successful and fulfilling conference. Thank you. Ready to Thank you very much. Thank He's you. ready to answer some of your questions. Maybe I could start with a general one. You was not here yesterday, but uh, Per Arne Vatle was here, and he was talking about um, the balance between trade and aviation for European politicians. What uh, do you mean in the Norwegian Ministry of Transport and Communication about that. Seeing from our side, we are maybe not uh, objective in this, but... Uh <laughs> <laughs> the, the question was the trade and aviation. Trade between the, the balance between yes. trade business and aviation business. As, uh, um, as I, 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 I said, uh, I think... Uh, uh, I think we should uh, say that aviation is uh, have two two different parts. Uh, it's uh, the one who is business, and uh, which we should not uh, uh, care much about. Uh, and uh, the other is uh, the need for transportation in all parts of uh, the countries, uh, the country. So, um, the balance, uh, I'm not quite sure what... It's always a balance, so that's a problem, yes, maybe. Yes, yeah. that's, that's the problem, so it's, uh, it's hard for me to, to give an uh, exact... Yeah. Uh, and it's not answer. easy for you to just step into <laughs> that. Do someone else has any question? Maybe we should um, go into the, this uh, team for the conference is turbulent times. Mm. And um, are there any advantages for Norwegian aviation that we should uh, really build up under to meet the competition? Any advice from you? Uh, I, I think uh, uh, what's the problem for the aviation in Norway is when, uh, as I said, when we discuss transportation, we focus a lot of bad roads and uh, railways. I think it's very important to show how important uh, aviation is for our country. Um, we remember uh, when we had this uh, ash problem, uh, then people saw, oh, <laughs> It's important for us, but in, on a daily basis, I don't think uh, people uh, think much about it. 
we have uh, this air going buses all over uh, the country so 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 my, my best advance is to to tell how important this is and I think you should support us when we are talk when we are looking at Avinor and the, uh, the airports as one they are connected uh, so some some talking about that we should have uh, uh, um, have uh, another way to finance the airports in Norway. I think that's a very bad idea to do that. <laughs> uh, and uh, but I, I feel uh, that uh, that uh, the industry and the government uh, in uh, the most uh, uh, questions working good together, uh, especially in the European. Uh, area uh, or, or questions of going outside uh, the country also, and uh, uh, my <coughs> so so my best advice is to say we are no way stops without us that's good <laughs> or maybe not good <laughs> <laughs> but it's a pleasure to hear but um um so, and that could be something that uh, Sula Henriksen said yesterday, that uh, Norway is a very little country, but uh, in my time, we are major. So, we can take uh, that as a goal, to yes. be that in aviation too. We are very glad to have you here, and we are very glad that you are flying from Stavanger to Oslo nearly every day. Yes. We really enjoy that. <laughs> and uh, we really enjoy also that um, you have a flexibility because that's what we want to give to our customers. And uh, we do whatever we can to stay behind the promises that you say that we will have to deliver next summer, maybe better mm. than we did this summer. I can say that, that Doug, can I? Really? That's okay. Mm. We struggled. But I think it, uh, we, th it will still snow, be snow in our way. Yeah, uh, it will be. We have to handle it, just handle it. Uh, and uh, uh, I think you can I, I don't think it's a good idea to bring us in a situation when uh, 40 centimeters of snow is no problem for uh, for an airport I think then we uh, waste money if we do so yeah. and we are working um, continuously on that because when we are working in European working groups and they talk about adverse condition as we have today then we are answering this is not adverse condition because this is normal operation yes. here in Norway so we have to be prepared for yes. that. Some of you? Then okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, we will continue uh, talking about snow. I, I, I saw the expression of uh, the Norwegian company that does uh, the infrastructure, the equipment for snow removal. I s you saw the expression outside yesterday? They don't call it n their no-ho, it's the snow-ho. <laughs> Very good. The next uh, speaker this morning is a professor. We always have a professor as a speaker at the Avignon conference, and uh, this year's conference is no exception. And he is a professor in economics. He got his uh, professor degree from uh, University of California, Berkeley, where he already had another degree, and after that he had another degree from the university in Oslo. And after finishing all these years of studying, he's well known in Norway as a commentator in media, as a columnist, and also an author of not less than four books about economics. So please welcome Mr. Erling Röd Larsen. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is uh, Erling Röd Larsen, or as they used to say in America when I lived there, Erling. Uh, uh, today we're going to talk about the world economy, what's causing the, the turbulence. Uh, before I go on, I need to extend the warning, uh, and the warning is that I tend to get very eager, uh, and when I get very eager, I speak really fast, and unfortunately, there's nothing to do about it. Uh, 
I inherited it from my mom, but I usually make a contract with the audience saying that I, I, do, I am aware of the fact that I get eager. I have a watch here. I'm going to watch it as much as I can, and then we're going to go on. Also, I'm going to say that usually when I introduce myself, I take a good look into people's eyes to see the response. And the reason why I do that has a history. And you see, uh, well, there's no hiding the fact that I'm, I'm a nerd. I'm the biggest nerd you probably ever will meet. I've done you know, a lot of degrees in math and economics. So where do I think I end, ended up? Well, I ended up in Stats Norway. Uh, I was there for 14 years. And I'm, when I did talks, because I do like to talk, uh, then I noticed that people, whenever I introduced myself, people let out a big sigh. <sighs> and since I was a researcher, I researched why. Uh, and I came to the conclusion that it had two reasons. One was good and one was bad. The good thing was, um, well, I guess good for the audience, was that they had a sigh for the reason thinking, ah, oh, finally a reason to sleep. And the other reason uh, was, I guess, worse, uh, both for, for the audience and me, and was something of a desperation sign, namely something like, oh my goodness, now there's only going to be tables and numbers. And of course, that's not to be surprised by the fact that Stats Norway they has a slogan, um, an institution that counts. Uh, but I always decided to fight that, because economics, yes, it's well documented in numbers and tables, but there is some artificial knowledge only in numbers and tables. So I always wanted to go behind the numbers, actually present a few, only a few numbers, and then talk about the mechanisms underneath, and that's what I'm going to do today. So uh, don't expect too many tables or numbers, it's going to be the, mechanis the big mechanisms underneath. Also, of course, you might be uh, amused to hear that um, I also investigated the response when I said I'm a professor at BI. Yeah, and then uh, I'm glad to report to you that the response is a little bit different and also, I guess, more positive. Because instead of saying, oh, now they're saying <coughs> something like this. And so I researched that as well. And I think the reason is that people think something like, oh my goodness, this guy teaches people how to make money. That's going to be good. And of course, you know, I don't want to uh, tell you the truth, but really, we, in economics, we don't do that. Uh, in economics, we uh, study countries, and we study numbers with nine or 12 digits, often in the red. We don't care. That's the luxury of economics. <laughs> so you know, don't expect any profitable uh, tips from today. Uh, there is a lot of stuff to talk, and my talk is basically two hours, and I'm trying to cram it into 20 minutes. So be prepared. Uh, There is uh, a lot of stuff going on. Um, and of course, this is exciting for people like me who study it. And it's very nerve wracking for the people who uh, are trying to invest money or mm, position themselves. First of all, uh, the euro is under pressure. That's no surprise to us in economics. The US is in bad weather. Uh, and now there's a new quantitative easing. China, it has challenges. We're going to take a look at it. Germany. Maybe this doesn't tell you much, but this is something that we would never, in economics, we never thought we would see that you actually get negative yield on a bond, two-year bond. This, to, to us, this is like a pseudo um, observing a unicorn. The unicorns are nice to think about, but they don't exist. And so now we, uh, we, we've had theories about negative yield, but we never thought we would talk about them. Now people are actually paying uh, the Bundesbank and others to actually store their money. And of course, you wonder why wouldn't they just stuff the money in the mattress? And the reason why is the size. You know, that would be, have to be one <laughs> big mattress. <laughs> Japan has become a museum. That's uh, too bad. The two questions, though, because uh, I would love to talk about all these things. Uh, I can't. I can focus only on two things. And there's going to be one good news, or one piece of good news, and there's going to be bad news. The good news is China. Uh, the bad news is Europe. Uh, but on, in order to answer this, we need to know where we came from, what caused the, the turbulence. And here's uh, one thing. We are able today to produce exactly the same and even more than we did in 2007. That's an interesting observation, given the fact that the world has much more dreams, much more demand than we have resources. So why don't we? Why do we let 25% people um, stay unemployed in Spain when there is so much need? Why? Uh, well, the reason is that we're um, picking up some slack. But keep in mind these people. The houses are there. The factories are there. People have not lost, lost their skills. The raw material, it's there. Everything is intact. Uh, the world has not been hit by a meteor. 
We can still produce what we did, and we pro produced a lot in 2007, so why don't we do it now? That's the big, big question that I would, um, would like you to know about and talk about uh, tonight over a glass of red wine. Uh, and to understand it, we have to uh, go into some details. The world is a very complex mechanism, and the world economy it, uh, is difficult. Here's the thing. In economics, the, the thing that keeps us awake at night is if people want to do the same thing. If we have synchronization, that is very challenging because people cannot do the same thing. Think about it. If you have a table, usually you have a seller and then you have a buyer. If everybody wants to be on the same side of the table, it's going to be very difficult. Then there's going to be no transaction. That's what we're observing today. Very difficult. What do people want to do? A lot of people want to save. But saving is also a transaction, because you're going to persuade someone to, to, to take your savings. If everybody wants to be on the same uh, side of the table saying that I want to save, that's going to be very difficult for the world economy, and that's the main problem. In order to um, really understand this, think of an example. Think of a miniature economy. Ten people, if you want to, you know, you think of Robinson and Friday and Thursday and Wednesday. They're all in an island. Ten people. And then everybody says, yes, we're going to buy, Absolutely, we're going to buy on one condition. We want to sell first. If all these 10 people say that, yes, we're going to buy, no problem, but we want to sell first, nothing's going to happen. The transaction volume is going to be zero. It's going to be in the, the biggest recession that uh, Little Island has ever seen. What does it take for it to come out? Well, think about this. If one buyer, the first buyer says, it drops his condition and says, well, I'm going to buy anyway. You know, I'm going to buy. I'm not going to insist upon selling first. If number one buys from number two, then number two has satisfied his condition. Then he can buy from number three. Number three can buy from number four. And then finally, number 10 buys from number one. Then uh, that economy goes from producing zero to producing 10. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the idea behind uh, the massive governmental intervention is that the government can be that buyer number one. The, buyer can, the, the government can break that chain of standstill. Yet, what we in economics are really afraid of is the fact that you know, government's um, powers it, it, it's limited, so we need to rely on the public too. And if everybody wants to do the same thing, that's what we lose sleep over. That's what we really don't want. So every time you see, um, see uh, signs of synchronization, be afraid, we are. The good thing, though, is that the crisis is man-made, so it's, uh, the solution can also be man-made. And basically, if you forced me at the point of a gun, you know, can you sum up the crisis in one word or two words? That's very hard for an economist, because we usually like to talk. I mean, we have trouble introducing ourselves in five minutes, so. <laughs> but if you press me, the idea, the, here's the thing. What caused the problems, what is causing the problem is Im trade imbalances. And here's an observation that you will think is completely trivial, and it is, but it's uh, good to think about it anyway. The world does not trade with the moon. The world does not trade with the moon. What does it mean? It means that if you collect all the trade surpluses in the world, they have got to be equal to the, all the trade imports, right? Exports must equal the imports. What does that mean? That means that if some countries have as a business plan to export, then other countries, well, it's not necessarily a plan, but they have to be persuaded to have imports. That's usually okay, because the world economy is such that sometimes people are exporters, sometimes people are importers, and over time it evens out. The problem, people, is that if people, some countries insist upon being exporters for a long time, and some countries are stuck in being importers for a long time, because what happens? What happens is that whenever goods go this way, debt goes the other way. And with debt comes power, or negative power. Um, and that's the problem. Then, then it goes from being just an economic problem to becoming a uh, political problem. Why? Because people uh, dislike uh, distributions. You know, you have to have then debt negotiations, and it's very troublesome. Instead of doing it, people burn tires in the streets. Right? Very, very difficult. All right. So before we go on to say exactly a uh, pinpoint uh, what is happening. I'm going to give you the short story of the financial crisis in just one minute, so gra grab a hold of your chair and maybe uh, take a sip of coffee. Here comes 10 years in 60 seconds, all right? Well, maybe a little bit more than 60 seconds. In, the, in 1997-98, I was a student in, uh, at Berkeley in California, and so I, a lot of my friends, they came from Asia. 
And uh, I re read Norwegian newspapers and Scandinavian newspapers at the time. I have a Danish wife, so I also like to read Danish newspapers. They're much better than Norwegian. Uh, anyway, very little talk in the Nordic uh, papers about the Asia crisis. Although in Asia, it was fantastically devastating. A big, big problem in Indonesia, Malaysia, South Korea, Thailand, Taiwan. People were losing their homes, mostly because capital had moved in and moved out too fast, and they couldn't adjust the currency. My bet, uh, and people were desperate. I, had, I talked to people over breakfast. Their mom and dad had lost their house in very desperate times in Asia. My belief is that in Beijing, people observed this and said, Never in the history of China will there be complaints from Washington DC flying over uh, Beijing, landing and dictating us terms. That's not going to happen. And so we're going to make a plan for that not to happen. And the plan is, of course, to stock up on dollars. If you stock up on dollars, that's not going to happen. And at least we don't know what they were thinking, but we know that that's consistent with what we saw. China stocked up on dollars for a long time. How? Well, they exported. And instead of importing using the export dollars, they bought American securities. That is something to think about, people, because it's very unusual. Usually, in almost all countries in the world history, when, when a country has been on that level of development, what they do is that they invest a lot and they consume a lot in order to satisfy um, the public. China did something else. So think of the, this picture. What across the Pacific Ocean was uh, frying pans and dolls, Usually what goes the other way is, you know, electricity, toilets, stuff, you know, to increase the standard of living. That did not happen. The dolls and the frying pans, they were uh, used to purchase American 10-year-old, 10-year-long bonds. That is very problematic in the sense that that disrupts the prices in the financial world. All right, I, I'm not going to bore you with this, so I'm going to say something that I usually don't say because I like people to reason themselves, but I'm going to say, trust me on this. When the demand for 10-year-long bonds increase, the prices uh, will increase, that's okay, but then the yield will fall, technical reasons. What happens is, here you have something that's extremely important, namely the yield curve. Short interest rate, long interest rates. Usually the banks make money. You know, they borrow short from you and me, and then they uh, lend long, right? They make money on that difference. Ladies and gentlemen, if the yield curve flattens, the banks are in trouble. That we, we observed this in the U.S. Uh, some of the causes were in Beijing. What happens? Well, I don't know. I wanted to have some vivid pictures on your mind. What I think happened is that some young guy just out of school sat in the boardrooms of the banks. He raised his hand and said, well, why can't we just uh, extend some loans and then take a fee and then sell the loans further? And then people said, really? We can do that? Sure, we can do that. I said, well, it's going to work. Who's going to buy? Well, let's worry about that later. Let's see if it happens. So at least what we observed is that the American banks, they started to, um, to do what we call securitization. Namely, instead of extending loans and keeping the loans themselves, they sold the loans. Right? And these were special loans, people. I mean, if you think, think about the loan called the Ninja, not only is the word scary in itself, the Ninja, because you see it's kind of sneaky, but I mean, if you think of the acronym, what it uh, stands for, it's loan people. These are loans to people with no income, no job, no asset. These are people coming in from the, from the park that, where they've stepped overnight, and they got loans, all right? Not a good thing. Then you might wonder, well, who in the world would buy these things? And economists, we wonder too, who did buy? And so we have searched for, uh, to find the buyer, and we have found the buyer. The buyer, you know, now my smile drops. The buyer was Düsseldorf, people in Germany, or, or uh, German banks. So they have taken big, big hits. And the German public, they were irritated because they realized that we're, we're uh, extending BMWs for uh, stocks in Lehman Brothers. Not a good deal. And the Financial Times says that the best producers in the world, they are, that, that's Germany. But the, the worst investors in the world, that's Germany too. <laughs> and it's true. Uh, or there's some truth to it. So people, we have seen then the, the financial crisis in a short story is a line going from Beijing, political decisions, to Boston, you know, having to do with the financial system, all the, across the Atlantic to Bonn. The world is interconnected. What happens in one place will affect uh, things in other place. All right, so that's, so, so people, this is uh, on the macro scale of the world. The fact that some countries, they want to export, that, that means that other countries have to import. Now, this surprises a lot of people because 
people think of Euro or the Eurozone as a zone where there's a lot of imports and exports. And that's not really true. The Eurozone is so big that mostly the trade is within the Eurozone. So it's possible for economic terms, just to make the analysis simple, to think of this as a closed economy. If it's a closed economy, the same thing holds as for the world. Since the world is a closed economy, because we don't trade with the moon, then exports need to balance with imports. The same thing basically happens in Eurozone. If some countries insist upon being exporters, some other countries must be importers. Right? And that's okay if they, uh, if they switch roles once in a while, but if one country has one role for a long time and other countries for a, for a long time, then goods go south, debt go north. With debt, you, really, you give up power, and that's, then it becomes a political decision. Very difficult. Uh, the problem then for the Eurozone is basically this. So people, imagine that you have a big switch. I mean, we're in the aviation industry here. You're used to having levers, right, and control things. So think of a, a big dashboard with 17 levers, right? Levers are good because with levers you can control things. And what in economics, what you really want to control, the most important tool of everything is the value of your money the currency. It's an extremely valuable tool, because overnight you could change things, the you could change the value of the whole production of your country in one second. Very useful, because then you can manipulate it. Now, you have a dashboard, 17 levers, it's really you know, full, uh, full throttle in Spain, should have been, and then you know, break in Germany. Now, when you have introduced the euro, what you do is you take a lasso, you get it around all the 17 levers, <coughs> and then you have one lever. You reduce 17 levers into one. That's got to be problematic. Think of that in, a, in an airplane, you know? That, well, that's not good. And in economics, it's very difficult, because what we're saying is that if you give up that lever, you give up what we call the external devaluation possibility, namely that you overnight can do something about the value of your production. If you give up that, you have something else has to come in, and what comes in is the, uh, the attempt of doing internal devaluations. What is an internal devaluation? Well, people. That's wage cuts. Wage cuts, people don't like it. They like to burn tires instead. <laughs> very, very difficult. I have to say, I don't see an easy solution out of the Eurozone. But the, so that's, uh, uh, that's the bad news. The good news is that I see a solution in China, or um, what kind of caused some of the turbulence is being corrected as we speak. Um, and here's, you need some pr perspective too. I used to, uh, my advisor uh, at Berkeley, his name was Brad DeLong, he was a, a world famous economist. I mean, his, his advisor again was Larry Summers, you know, uh, the financial ad um, finance minister under Clinton. So Brad DeLong was, you know, uh, a big man. And, and although I'm very loquacious and like to talk, I didn't get a word in with Brad. <laughs> he would just lecture me. And so we would go to, co uh, to coffee shops anyway, and he would talk, and he would say, Erling, why in the world do you think um, uh, China um, exports so much? And then he would let me ponder, because you know, he was going to answer himself. But he also said, Erling, think about it. I mean, if you, if you want, think of this. Assume that you're going to be a histor historian a thousand years from now, and you're going to write the history of the world. What are you going to write about for the 1990s, the 2000s? Maybe you have a sentence or two, you know. A thousand years from now, you know, we're not going to uh, spend much time on the 2000s, although we find that a little bit hard to believe that's going to be true. And then he said, there's, you know, forget about Clinton, forget about Bush, forget about a lot of th stuff. The one thing they will say, the one thing they will write a thousand years from now is that the world economy added 1.3 billion workers. That's the big thing. 1.3 billion workers. That's unheard of in economic history. That's huge. So it's not to be, we're not to be surprised by the fact that you have some repricing trouble with you know, the price of capital and price of workers. That's, and that's basically what we're seeing you know, in, the, in the world of trade imbalances. Some goods became really cheap because uh, uh, cheap hands made them. So in perspective, this is to be understandable. Although we struggle now, it's also worthwhile to think about... I, so people, uh, conspiracy, conspiracy theories are always funny, and they're always entertaining, and you should, well, once in a while there's something to it. I'm not going to do too much of it, but I want you to ponder this. Usually, countries that are developing, they have huge uh, uh, imports. Why? Because they're building their country. 
right? Norway, for example, had a huge uh, deficit in the 70s. Many people have forgotten it. We had deficits on the scale of Greece. But they were good deficits. Why? Because we bought things we couldn't make ourselves, namely big oil rigs. You know? Our intention was to pay things back. Um, oh, no comment on the, on the parallel south. Uh, and we did pay it back. Uh, China, however, I mean, most countries, you'd expect China to import a lot because uh, they need everything. And they didn't. They positioned all their exports or a lot of their exports in American securities. Think about it. Why did they do it? Hmm. And then, I, so think about that. Think about also the fact that when the finance minister, uh, Tim Geithner, visited Beijing, you know, did you observe his greeting? Here's his bow. And I usually say, this is the bow of the debtor. <laughs> See, do you think the Chinese liked it? You bet. <laughs> this is homework. You know that it's a professor's uh, privilege to extend homework. So Friday night, you know, you, you, and then give me a call if it's something you wonder about. There are uh, some challenges. We're going to talk about two, not three. China, as I told you, the big thing that you have to think about is that the world is a closed economy. Any exports has to be balanced by imports, just by philosophical logic and by accounting necessity. That's got to hold. And the big exporters in the world, they are China, uh, Germany, and Japan, right? Now the good thing is that China's new role is being accepted, and what I think, if you ask me, this is the good news. Usually we, uh, the problems in the 2000s were the fact that you had a big country, they wanted to export, they wanted to have a lot of dollars, and so you heard a lot of shh, that, would, that was good, goods leaving China. Now we're going to hear a lot of shh, and that, that sound is the sound of China sucking in goods from all over the world. They're changing their strategy, people. I hope you observe the news. You know, there's a change of leadership now, and they're going to build China. You know? They used to have an investment level of 46% of GDP. 46% of what they made went into reinvestment. That's, people, that's unheard of. That's both fantastic and you know, also difficult, because you wouldn't get that in a democracy. People would uh, revolt. Whereas now, but now they're rebuilding it. They're going to consume more, which is a really good thing, because they're going to buy from all over the world. So that's the good news. The troublesome news, though, is uh, uh, closer to home. That's the Eurozone. Uh, I ask rhetorically, do London and Manchester need their own currencies? No. They are the same. They talk the same language. Uh, they can move in between. They don't need their own currency. Westful, Westful? No. You know, for reasons we can uh, easily fathom. Do England and Bolivia need their own currencies? Yes. Distance, language, troublesome. Now comes the you know, one billion trillion dollar question. Do Spain and Germany need their own currency? Yes. And the main reason is the following. In economics, American, American economists were really worried about the introduction of the euro because they said that this is not going to work. And why? Because usually if you need currencies for the ability to manipulate exchange rates and interest. That's very good because that's our accelerator. You can accelerate or decelerate. If you give up that, you have to have something in, instead. And usually we say interest rate flexibility can be uh, substituted for by labor mobility. People can move out of unemployment and into employment if, uh, if need be. In the US, that's why it works. The California, Massachusetts, is very different, but it works because people move. You know, you cannot adjust uh, the exchange rate between California and Massachusetts, but you can adjust how much labor they have. That's what we can't do in Europe. That's why I'm very skeptical. People speak different languages. They have different cultures. I mean, imagine a guy coming, coming from Dublin, from Temple Bar District, and he goes to, to, to Munich, and he wants to have a bratwurst and, uh, and some uh, in the Bierstube. You know, that's not going to work. Very different cultures. So what then is going to adjust? It's very hard to see if you don't have the interest rate flexibility and you don't have the wage flexibility because people burn tires instead and people don't move. What's I, I'm, I am uh, very skeptical, I have to say. So one piece of good news, one piece of bad news, my time is running out. Uh, so I have to extend a little bit more of homework, I think. The United States, homework for you over a glass or two of red wine. See that animal? That's the US economy right now troublesome to ride. I'm saying 
the world economy is facing two big challenges. They ha both have to do with trade imbalances. Uh, my view is that one way it's going to be uh, is being corrected as we speak, namely China. They are rebuilding, they're retooling the whole uh, business model. The other uh, problem in Europe, due to the introduction of euro, which was a political decision, not an economic tool, that's hard to see a happy ending out of, I have to say. Uh, and with that, what do I do? I cross my fingers for the world economy and say thank you. Thank you, Erling. I'm, I'm sorry we only gave you 25 minutes. Uh, I think we could. <laughs> I tried uh, to cram in one uh, hour into 25 minutes. I think we easily could have listened uh, to you for two hours. Uh, you remember that um, song Monty Python made uh, in the 80s? I like Chinese. Should we mm. all start to sing that? <laughs> no, that yeah, that would be good. And yeah, I, I mean, China, China people, it's, it's a fascinating story because, uh, I mean, the introduction of all these people into the world economy, of course, it's the biggest, the biggest event in about, you know, 100 or 200 years. Huge moment and difficult for the world to absorb. That was basically the trouble with uh, some currency movements and financial markets and everything in the 2000s. But the good news is they're now retooling. Please read carefully the reports from China. Now they're changing the guards of the nine-man Politburo. And the new generation, they're going to see, well, and of course, think about these people. You have nine men here, nine, and then you have 1.3 billion people. 1.3 billion, nine. <laughs> I think the nine people, they are wary and aware of the needs of the 1.3 billion. <laughs> so they're starting to think, hmm, they need uh, fridges and uh, stoves and toilets. And so that's going to be uh, the basis for the imports, which is very good news. So. Of course, uh, all these people uh, here, they are in the value chain in aviation. So mm -hmm. we think, well, what does this mean to us? Does it mean that we will depend on the Chinese to consume more Western goods so we can afford to fly more and use more money in the duty-free? Or will we have to wait for the 1.3 million to come to our airports and our duty-free shops? I think both, actually. And uh, what they're doing right now, and what many people don't know, is that uh, China has a de trade deficit with some countries. Uh, for example, one of the countries uh, that exports the most to China is actually Germany. German, Germany and Germans, they can produce stuff that nobody else can. I mean, the Chinese, they can pr produce dolls and frying pans at $10 and $2. What do the uh, Germans produce? They produce huge turbines of worth $100 million. Nobody can do it. Siemens, they produce and sell stuff to China. And so, of course, talking about you know, transportation needs, oh yeah. Talking about, talking about skills, you know, BI, where I work, what do we do? Well, we actually, uh, we go into China, and now we start to teach Chinese people. So we have a university, we, we have uh, started to collaborate with the university in, in Fudan in China, and you know, they send people like me down there to teach. You know, so talking about exports, and the Chinese then are importing not goods but services. That's going to happen. How about the, uh, the rich people? We're used to uh, rich Russians coming and buying up uh, Swiss chalets and stuff. Now the Chinese are going to come, and we do know when we observe the Chinese, they do not buy a uh, Swatch, you know, they buy the Rolexes, you know, they come in and, and they, they buy. And they, they want to visit, uh, you know, they visit Stockholm and Copenhagen and, of course, the Hardangerfjord and everything. So, both ways, yes. If the <laughs> I could go on. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any questions from uh, the audience? Uh, uh, what, what about... <clears throat> How important is your competences in macroeconomics? Yeah. How, how, how important do you see aviation for the macroeconomics in, in this world? It's hugely important. I mean, and we're t the mention of the ash crisis last year just observed. I mean, when the aviation industry is down, you know, everything is down. So we really need it, and not only for the Europe, for the world, but also for. Uh, for Norway, of course. I mean, if you take a look at the globe and observe this long country, and uh, we have a lot of mountains, and you know, the mountains are difficult to, uh, to to go through in terms of making tunnels. So flying over them, it, you know, it's a pretty smart idea. The trouble, though, and I, we're, we, in economics, we take a huge interest into the aviation industry because it's a it's it's a very good example of something that we find very challenging to teach, namely a spe special. Of course, you know about this, but the cost structure is very important. Uh, very difficult in the sense that you have a lot of fixed investments in order to fly the first passenger 
You have to have airports, you have to have a plane, you have to have a lot of stuff. After you've done that, the marginal cost of lifting one other person up in there, you know, the difference between the, the cost of the first passenger and the second is huge. So the marginal costs are small because, you know, once the plane is there and there's a, f a free seat on, on it, you know, the marginal costs are not <coughs> substantial, but the, uh, the fixed costs are huge. That means that it's a trouble for a country like Norway because we, we need a lot of fixed investments, yet we don't have a huge population base, right? So, you know, it, that's a huge challenge, and it's on a different scale. It's the same thing for, for Europe, you know, the, in terms of the number of airports and number of uh, routes, uh, difficult, but very important. There's a lot of countries, I think, that's willing to borrow Norway more people. You know. Yeah, yeah. That, well, we're <laughs> observing it. I mean, recently, the, the number of uh, Pol people from Poland uh, coming in here in the last six or seven years, we're, with the numbers are uh, 100,000 people and more, and counting. Right? Uh, they, uh, they're fly flying b back to Warsaw and up again. You know, they're not swimming. You know, <laughs> well, some of them are actually driving all the way, I guess. But uh, uh, but the when the Chinese come, they will not drive. I guess not. That's a long distance, huh? <laughs> Although yes. we heard yesterday that the expression in the world "far away" does not exist anymore in this world. That is true. But now Erling has to go far away. Yeah. He has told me. Uh, so <laughs> I'm all always on 24/7. <laughs> Call him if you something you <coughs> need an answer for. So please, again, thank you to Ali. <laughs> and, <coughs> and Erling, to measure the turbulent times, this is a weather station. Oh, oh wow. And thank I you. see you back here at uh, 10.30. Thank you.